Welcome to this AP Macro Economics review. Um, I'm just chilling in my bed. Thought I would be thought it'd be fun to take the 2005 AP test since I have it here. Um, I was able to find the test at AP uh, Survival. Let's see if I can spell that right. Dot Weebly. Dot com. Good resource. We got a couple old tests that you can look at and some other review materials. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, but I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply walk through the 2005 test and kind of um, speak my thought process out aloud. And uh, hopefully it helps you as you kind of prepare for your AP Macro test. So uh, let's get started. In a mixed economy, oh, let me, before I dive in, I would suggest, um, as I go through this, you know, try solve the problem yourself. You know, pause the video for a second if you need to, read the problem, try solve it, and then uh, see if your answer agrees with mine. So, in a mixed economy, uh, what to produce, how to produce, and how much to produce are determined by... So I'd pause the video a second here and see if you can answer. The key here is it's a mixed economy. That means um, it's a mix of uh, market control and uh, a central planning agency. So a central planning agency would be a pure command economy. Um, actually, any of these planning agencies are not uh, what we're looking for. In a mixed economy, we have some free market. We also have uh, the government involved. So the answer there is D, um, and it's not determined by large corporations and small entrepreneurs. D is the only one that makes sense. Number two, the major difference between real and nominal GDP is... Okay, that was your pause there to pause the video while you think about it. Um, it's not that it excludes gov uh, government transfer payments. Um, excluding exports... Uh, sorry, excluding imports is not, maybe if we're thinking about the difference between GNP and PNP, but uh, I won't get into that, um, is adjusted for price level changes using a price index. Yes, that's the big difference between real and nominal. Real adjusts for prices, nominal doesn't. Um, you can read those other two, but I'm satisfied with my answer. Number three. Which of the following statements exemplifies the concept of structural unemployment? Structural unemployment is the idea that uh, some people don't have uh, the right skills that they need for a job. So, um, not new entrants, that's real entrance into the labor force after while finding jobs. That's really uh, that frictional unemployment. Uh, same with workers leaving their jobs to find better jobs. Um, if workers are laid off because of aggregate demand declining, that's cyclical unemployment. Workers are fired because consumers have reduced their total expenditures. That's essentially the exact same thing that C said. The only answer left is E. Workers laid off uh, or fired because their skills are no longer on demand. That is structural unemployment. Number four, uh, assume that consumers, for consumers, pears and apples are substitutes. Um, it is announced that pesticides are used on most apples. Uh, it is announced that pesticides used on most apples can be dangerous to consumers' health. As a result of the announcement, which is, which of the following is most likely to occur in the short run? in the pear market. Uh, this, well, um, this question has uh, five graphs that you'd have to look at. Um, so let me scroll through those. You can see A, B, C, and D. And then I'll let you see those last two there as you try to come up with your answer. Um, when I read this question, it actually strikes me more as uh, more fitting for a uh, 
for microeconomics. Um, but the question here is, let's see. Pesticides used on apples can be dangerous to consumers. If pesticides are dangerous to consumers, um, what's going to happen to pears? Well, um, people aren't going to want the apples. People are going to want the pears instead. And so what we're going to see is that increase in demand for pears. We'd see a decrease in demand for apples, kind of like seed. This is the uh, market for pears that we're looking at. Uh, let's see, number five. Federal budget deficits occur when... Um, well, federal budget de deficit, I mean, is just the government spending more money than it takes. Oh, I think I just answered that question. It's C, the federal government spends more than it collects in a tax year. So no, it's not more money being spent on entitlement programs than has been allocated. That doesn't necessarily mean a deficit. Um, if the IRS spends more than it collects in tax, the IRS doesn't spend the money. The IRS collects taxes. Congress spends the money. Uh, high levels of unemployment use up tax collections. No. Um, interest payments on the national debt increase from one year to the next. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean that... Uh, that might be happening, but that doesn't necessarily mean there is a deficit. So let's see, number six. Under which of the following conditions would consumer spending most likely increase? Well, um, if they have large unpaid balances on their credit card, I don't think consumers are going to want to spend. They're going to be, they might need to pay off those credit cards. If consumers' wealth is increased by changes in the stock market, well, if they've got more wealth, they might be more likely to spend it because they feel like they have, they have the security that they need. So I do like B. Let's read the rest of them, though. The government encourages consumers to increase their savings. No, that would mean they save more and spend less. Uh, if Social Security taxes are increased, then people have less money to spend. And if consumers believe they will not receive pay increases next year, well, if they don't think they're going to get a pay raise, they're going to be a little more cautious with their money. And so they're probably not going to spend more. They'll probably spend less. Number seven, crowding out is best described as which of the following? Uh, the whole idea of crowding out is that idea that uh, if the government has a budget deficit, um, in the I'm going to quickly draw a graph over here, the loanable funds market, uh, supply of loanable funds, loanable funds, and that interest rate. Well, anyway, if uh, the government is running a deficit, then the demand for loanable funds goes up, and thus interest rates go up. That's not maybe the prettiest graph I've ever drawn, but that's the idea. So um, let's go through these. Crowding out is best described as the decrease in full employment. No. Uh, the decrease in consumption or private investment spending caused by an increase in the in government spending. Uh, that one makes sense, right? As government spends more, they run deficits, and so they have to borrow money, which drives up interest rates and crowds out uh, private investment or, or consumption on things like cars where you have to borrow money. Uh, let's see. C, the decrease in government... No, it's not a decrease in spending. Um, the increase... The amount of capital outflow caused by an increase in government spending, no, that's not a crowding out effect. Um, and then the increase in the amount of capital inflow, no, it doesn't really have to do with capital inflow or outflow. Uh, it really has to do with that pushing out investment. So let's go with B. Number eight, under a fractional reserve banking systems, banks are required to... This is that whole reserve ratio. That means they are required to keep some of that money on hand. 
Uh, they aren't required to do any of these other things. You can read through those. But yeah, fractional reserve system is what we have. It just means banks keep a fraction of the money that gets deposited on hand. I think I'll do one more page in this video and then uh, and then I'll jump on to I'll pause it and maybe do a second video uh, for some more of the test. An increase in which of the following will increase aggregate demand? Well, if we increase taxes, people have less money. Aggregate demand is, again if you forget, aggregate demand is really consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. So, yeah, an increase in government spending does increase aggregate demand. Uh, if you change the Fed, if you increase the Fed funds rate, huh, or increase the reserve requirement, or increase the discount rate, those are all monetary policies that actually reduce the money supply. So all of those actually decrease, um, well, they decrease investment and thus decrease aggregate demand. Number 10. When the United States government engages in deficit spending, that spending is primarily financed. Um, how do they do that? Well, if you remember from class, I, I remember I drew those wonderful IOU notes. Those IOU notes are bonds. So yeah, when they need to borrow money, they issue bonds. They don't uh, change the reserve requirement, they don't borrow from the World Bank, um, and they don't change the value of the dollar, they issue bonds. Number 11. When the Federal Reserve buys government securities on the open market, what will happen in the short run? Um, so yeah, pause a second there. Oh, sorry, which of the following will decrease in the short run? I should read the question right. Um, well, if the Fed is buying stuff, here, I'll draw the little Fed building. That's pretty. When they buy stuff, in order to do that, they have to, they don't literally have to print off money, but they print off money, and they increase the money supply. That money is going out to buy stuff. That was a pretty drawing. Make it a one dollar bill. Um, anyway, uh, when they are buying stuff, they are increasing the money supply. If they increase the money supply, supply of money increases, demand for money, interest rates. There was my little money market graph. Uh, interest rates are actually going to decrease. Uh, it has no effect on taxes, no effect. Well, it should have an effect on uh, investment. It'll actually increase investment because interest rates are dropping. Um, It'll increase the amount of money that banks have that they can loan, because they've bought those um, open mar uh, bought those securities from the bank, so they now have cash, and it will actually increase the money supply. So yes, interest rates is the correct answer. Number twelve, which of the following factors would affect the growth of an economy? So you've got three choices there, um, and then of course you got to choose which ones make sense there. So, um, if we had the quantity and quality of human and natural resources, um, if you had more efficient workers and you had better resources, uh, that could definitely affect the growth of an economy, so I like that one. Uh, the amount of capital goods available, uh, capital goods being like machinery, so yeah, the more machinery available... And if you produce more machinery, it's going to allow you to produce more stuff in the future. So yeah, that I like that one. Um, and yeah, technology. If you have improving technology, I think that would uh, affect the growth of an economy. So I'm actually going to go with E, all three of those. A, or 1, 2, and 3. Alright, number 13. According to the short run Phillips curve, oh, this is just definitely a Phillips curve. So according to the short runs Philip curve, there is a trade-off between uh, it doesn't compare interest rates and inflation. It doesn't have anything to do with money supply. Um, 
it doesn't talk about this is economic growth because if you have economic growth you probably end up with inflation and there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation which is the correct answer uh, that's kind of a tempting one um, and but no it's not a has nothing to do with interest rates there so short run Phillips curve if you remember it looks like so and it looks at uh, inflation inflation and unemployment that's a horribly ugly graph I shouldn't have even drawn that beautiful all right number 14 um, a favorable supply shock okay so a supply shock as soon as I read that favorable supply shock has something to do with the aggregate supply curve all right a favorable supply shock such as a decrease in energy prices is most likely to have which of the following short run effects on price level and output well to answer that question I simply draw my aggregate demand Ugh. I gotta write this a little bit better. I'll call it aggregate demand, aggregate supply. And we have a favorable uh, supply shock, so it actually decreases costs and increases supply. So it looks like price level is going to decrease. I'll we'll cross those three out. And output is actually going to increase from here to here. I know that was really sloppy, but that graph is going to explain my answer. I'm going to go with 14B. And lastly for this video, and then I'll move on and do another video, number 15, uh, which of the following best explains why many United States economists support free international trade? Uh, the big thing here, of course, is that when you trade, it is possible, because of comparative advantage, that um, that both sides are able to benefit. And ultimately what happens is consumers are able to benefit from lower prices. So uh, workers who lose their job, can, that's not a good thing. So no. It is important to reduce world inflation, more important to reduce world inflation than to reduce United States unemployment. That's not a reason for free trade. Uh, workers are affected, so that's just a dumb answer. Uh, long run gains to consumers and some producers exceed the losses to other producers. That makes sense because there are gains to consumers, we get cheaper stuff, um, and some producers are able to sell overseas. Uh, some producers lose a little bit because they have increased competition, but I like that answer. And government can protect the United States industries while encouraging free trade. That's actually not really true, so no. So anyway, there's the first 15 questions. I'll come back with um, parts, I don't know, 2, 3, and 4 of this video where I go over the rest of this test. Um, I hope this provides some benefit as you try to uh, prepare for the AP test.